call, and I'm sure we'll get him eventually. Um, I want to just do the roll call real quick. So when I call your name, just you know chime in and say you're here, so we can have that on the record. Um, Steve Atkinson. I heard a ping, Steve. Okay, I'm here. Okay. Sorry, I had you on. Had you on mute. Yeah, you just got to hit the button at the bottom. All right, now mute yourself again. Monty Deal. Here. AJ Erskine. Here. Mark Federici. He's the one we don't think is here yet. Okay. Daniel Knott. Here. Okay, Rob Latour. Here. Mike Leonard. Here. Shannon Madsen. Here. Chris Moore. Here. And Ken Schultz, we're trying to get on the line. Um, so uh, the only person we haven't heard from is uh, Mark. Uh, let, let the record know, um, show that we do have a quorum for tonight's meeting. Um, for tonight's, for this, for this meeting, the way we we do this for uh, public comment, if you'd like to give, uh, if you'd like to give public comment at the end of the meeting for people who are on the call, um, please just if you're on, if you're on the WebEx, you can just put it in the chat, and we will we will get that information. We'll get your name. <laughs> and then we'll be able to identify you and then you'll have your turn to speak. For those people that are calling in, after we go through all the people who are on the chat list, we'll open up the phone and then you'll each have to get a, a, get a chance to speak. And we are going to limit that to three minutes, um, you know, three, three minutes speaking time for the public comments, and that will be at the end of the meeting. Um, the next agenda item is the approval of the minutes. Uh, I hope you've all you all got a copy of the minutes and had a chance to look through them. Are there any questions about any qu questions about the the minutes at all? Any revisions that need to be done? Okay. Yeah, is, not a, CJ, I'd make a motion to approve the minutes from April twenty. Okay. Uh, second that motion. Yeah, this is Monty. I second it. Okay. All right. Uh, now we're on to. Um, Onto our new business, which is uh, one of the things we didn't do last meeting because it was our first meeting, but uh, we want to elect a chairman and a vice chair. So at this time, I will um, accept nominations for a chairman. Pat, this is Monty. I would uh, I would like to nominate uh, Dr. Rob Latour. And do we have a second for that? This is Chris Moore. I'll second that. Okay. We, uh, so um, no, uh, we have nomination by Monty Deal and the second foot by Chris Moore for Dr. Rob Latour. Uh, are there any other nominations? Okay, hearing none, the nominations are closed. And so we usually do we do it as quickly as possible once we get somebody on the hook. Uh, is there anybody opposed to Rob serving as chairman? Okay. Hearing none, the motion passes by consent. Congratulations, Rob, and now you're chairman, and I can yield the floor to you. You have it, Rob. Thanks, Pat. Everybody can hear me, I assume. Um, so next order of business is electing a vice chair. Um, so I'll open the floor for nominations of a vice chair. This is AJ, I'll, I'll nominate uh, Monty Deal. Rob, Rob, this is Monty. I, AJ beat me to it, but I was going to uh, nominate uh, Shanna Madsen. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll yield and, and second that nomination. That sounds good. Um, any other nominations? All right, we'll close that. And Shanna, welcome as vice chair. Thank you. Thank you. And as it turns out, you're next up on the agenda. So we'll, okay. we'll uh, I guess you'll share your screen. Is that correct? You have some, you have some slides to share with us of on reference points and the, and the TAC update. I do. Take it away. All right. All right Great. Oh, go ahead, Pat. Did you have something? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I was just going to bring up that, um, you know, between you and you and Shanna, you probably have probably close to 30 years of experience working with Menhaden and it's, you know, 
I, I think it's it's going to be great for this committee. It, it, it's a pleasure to work with you, and uh, I'm awfully glad that Shannon decided to take take the job when I offered to her, you know, about a year ago now. So I think that those are good choices by this committee, and I think it's going to work out well. Thank you. Thanks, Pat. Um, yes, the years are piling up faster than we, we realize, I suppose, yes. Um, so thanks, Shanna. You have the floor. Let us know how things went at the board meeting. Happy to, Rob, and, and thank you for those kind words, Pat. I'm very happy to be here as well. Um, so what I kind of wanted to update everyone on um, this meeting was all the things that have happened in 2020 um, with Coastal, uh, Coastal Atlantic Manhattan Management. Um, I'm sure most of you have been very closely watching, so some of this uh, might be a little bit repetitive, but I thought it best to kind of bring everyone to the fold so we all kind of know exactly uh, what's been going on this year. So um, just to start off with an outline, the first thing I kind of wanted to talk to everyone about today was our uh, ecosystem reference point history. Just a really quick background. I recognize that group has been going for a very long time and, and Rob and I have been a part of that, so we don't have to rehash everything. Um, and then from there, I want to move into some of the models and the different structures that we put in place with some of these ecosystem models. Um, and then you'll see a lot of really familiar stuff that's been presented at the board meetings throughout the year um, with the ERP work group, different analyses that we conducted um, and the management recommendations that were stemming from these different um, analyses. Uh, and finally, I'll wrap up the presentation with the total allowable catch that was set um, at the last Menhaden board meeting and what that looks like for Virginia's different sectors of allocation. So to start off with our history, um, traditionally Menhaden has been managed with a single species assessment, which means we're just really looking kind of at Menhaden alone. Um, and that is done with the Beaufort assessment model. Um, this is a, a really robust model. It's been through several peer reviews. Um, we consistently come back to it and it provides us a lot of information on abundance um, and fishing mortality coastwide. Um, however, uh, the Menhaden board has always been very interested in making sure that uh, Menhaden are considered in this ecosystem context. And so back in 2010, the Atlantic Menhaden Management Board tasked various TCs with developing alternative reference points for Menhaden that account for predation. Um, and so the first step in that process was uh, what we built was a model um, that some of you might have heard of. It's the MSDPA. Um, and the MSDPA essentially gives you this natural mortality matrix. And you take that matrix and you put it into the single species model. Um, and we did this for several single species updates. Um, however, the MS, uh, the MSDPA and the concurrent natural mortality matrix doesn't make this an ecosystem model. And so um, this committee, the ERP work group, um, has been recommending to the board through the years that we start to look at more multi-species modeling approaches um, and make this more of an ecosystem model. Um, also along with the fact that the MSVPA is a really data hungry model and it only produ produces one little part that gets plugged into another model um, so we recommended kind of moving forward with this larger idea of an ecosystem model. So back in 2015, the ERP work group presented a bunch of preliminary models that could be used to generate ecosystem reference points. Um, and that went to peer review along with the Beaufort assessment model. And peer reviewers looked at all of these different modeling approaches and suggested essentially that the group really focus on models of intermediate complexity. So not something that's this, this huge, you know, mega data hungry model and not something that is really, really basic, but kind of something that rides the line between those two things. So once we got that feedback from the peer reviewers, ASMFC decided to hold what they called the Ecosystem Management Objectives Workshop. Um, and we did that in 2016, um, and it included uh, commissioners, stakeholders and technical representatives to identify what 
goals and objectives they had for the entire ecosystem. Um, these were then reviewed and approved by the Atlantic um, Menhaden Board. Um, and then the BERT work group assessed the ability of each of these preliminary models that we had just presented to address those identified management objectives and performance measures. And then we selected a couple of candidate models accordingly. Um, back in December of last year, there was five modeling approaches that we kind of put forward um, and those went to peer review along with that single species SAM model. And just real quickly, so these were the various ERP models that went forward in peer review. We don't have to get into all of this, but the suite of models kind of ranged from that idea of very simple with minimal assumptions and minimal data requirements to really complex with a lot of assumptions about trophic interactions and really, really heavy data requirements. Um, and this kind of let us explore the effects of model structure and assumptions on our final results and evaluate the trade-offs between realism and complexity and data needs. Um, and where that group sort of fell was with the more intermediate models. You've probably heard of the NWAX mice. That's obviously the one that we went with. Um, and that's actually a streamlined version of an even larger eco passive ecosystem model. Um, and another model that we strongly considered was a multi-species multi statistical catch at age. So, kind of similar to what you usually see with catch and age models, but it just incorporates a lot more uh, species. So um, as we were analyzing these different modeling approaches, uh, they're all kind of structured differently, but we wanted to make sure that the models were as comparable as possible. So they're using the same input data for the predator and prey species, and where they overlapped, we explored the same suite of predators and prey. Um, you know, not all of the models use the same species and some of those uh, prey groups and predators differ. Um, however, these are the key ERP species that you'll hear the board and the technical committees talking about and referencing. Um, the reason that we made these choices was based on available diet information and the quality of the available data for those species. Um, and also the relevance to ASMFC management process. Um, again, not all the models used all of these species, um, while some of them actually used even more species. So the things like the uh, full um, EcoPass with EcoSim model has, you know, 96 different pools of species going into it. Um, however, all of these species that you see up here, Menhaden herring, our two prey species and our predator species, bluefish, spiny dogfish, striped bass, and weak fish, all had a benchmark assessment or an assessment update that had data through 2017 available. So a lot of the data streams that we put into our ecosystem models come from the single species models for each of these different um, key species. So after deliberation um, and after listening to all of the uh, information and recommendations that we got from our peer reviewers, the um, work group recommended a combination of using the BAM single species model and this NWAX mice model as a tool for managers to evaluate trade-offs. Um, NWAX is short for Northwest Atlantic Coastal Shelf Model of intermediate complexity for ecosystems, but that's a whole mouthful. So you're gonna hear me refer to it as NWAX mice from now on. Um, and the reason that we selected the use of these two models is because they work in tandem. So information from that single species BAM model um, and the other single species models are input into this ecosystem model. And then the BAM also is what's used to generate short-term projections that are used for the um, total allowable catch setting process. So if you've been tracking Menhaden management, you'll still hear us using both of these models. Um, they're both really robust and that's what we'll continue doing at least into the near future. Um, both of these models passed that peer review process in 2019. Um, and so the board began discussing the ecosystem reference points that were generated through the use of that NWAX mice model this year in 2020. 
So the problem with equally ecological reference points, or maybe just like the interesting point of them is there's no right answer. So even with a selected model, the board still needs to make some decisions about what they want the ecosystem to look like. Um, so you can think of this model as a really good way to analyze trade-offs between predators and prey. Um, I kind of think of it as like a complicated machine with a bunch of different dials and buttons. And whenever you press one dial or, you know, turn something, it impacts everything else in the ecosystem. So this model really helps to illustrate the trade-offs, but it doesn't necessarily provide you an answer. You kind of need to think about what you want your ecosystem to look like. So what the uh, work group did to help the board visualize this was they developed an example ERP target and threshold, and that was based off of uh, striped bass. Um, Atlantic striped bass was the focal species for ERP definitions because it was what we found to be the most sensitive predator fish species um, to Atlantic menhaden harvest in the model. So the ERP target and threshold that we provided were such that they would sustain striped bass and would likely provide sufficient forage for other predators under what we considered current ecosystems. So, um, what that means is for the development of this particular ecosystem reference point set, um, it means that all of the other focal species in the model, meaning bluefish, weak fish, spiny dogfish, and Atlantic herring, were assumed to be fish at 2017 levels, because that was, you know, that was the time frame that we had that full complete data set to work off of. So the target is defined as the maximum fishing pressure on menhaden that can sustain striped bass at their biomass target when striped bass are fished at their F target. And then the ERP threshold is defined as the maximum fishing pressure on menhaden that keeps striped bass at their biomass threshold when striped bass are fished at their F target. So just so everybody can kind of orient themselves to what uh, status quo 2017 conditions look like, um, I just wanted to throw up uh, this quick chart. Um, so for herring, uh, we're technically not overfishing, but the projections are running negative. Um, and um, the biomass status is below the target, but just not, not overfished yet. Um, for bluefish, we are in a state of overfishing. Um, we are overfished. Spiny dogfish are in the green. They're below the red uh, F target but above their spawning stock biomass target. And weak fish is a little different. Um, we're kind of unable to set those overfishing or overfish status uh, just because of you know, lack of data. We're using um, a different type of model, but we're able to say that total mortality for weak fish is too high and the stock's biomass is depleted. So this is what we're kind of looking at right now for 2017 conditions. Um, so when the board kind of looked over these uh, example reference points, they tasked the work group with conducting some additional runs of the tool to explore the sensitivity of those uh, example reference points to different assumptions about ecosystem conditions. So these are just some examples of some of the other um, ecosystem scenarios, I'd call them, um, where we kind of modified where things were fished at so we can kind of look at the outcome of the ERPs from here. Um, just a quick note, um, it's that so for our ERP focal species, what is defined as their F target and F threshold are defined as the F rates within that model that lets the species best approximate their biomass targets and thresholds respectively. So those might vary from what you would normally see coming out of a single species assessment, but you got to have everything comparing apples to apples. So that's why there are some kind of modifications there. So these are the ERP targets and thresholds that were resulting from different ecosystem scenarios. Um, so that first one there is the example scenario that was provided to the board. Um, and uh, that's the one that we were discussing with right bass being that focal species because it's the most sensitive predator. 
Um, and then we did a few other um, we did a few other scenarios just to kind of check the sensitivity of the model. Um, you can see the one is, we have a little bit of a star at all at the target, and that's just because when we fish at Linux carrying at their biomass target and striped bass for fish at their F target, the threshold was undefined, means that uh, none of the Atlantic and Hayden fishery uh, F values uh, that we explored actually pushed striped bass to their biomass threshold. So that's just an important thing to note because what we realized through doing these additional analyses was that the relationship between Atlantic herring and striped bass ended up being a lot stronger than the work group uh, anticipated. Um, and we observed that the model actually predicted a higher proportion of Atlantic herring in the diets of striped bass than what has been observed in coastwide diet studies. So that kind of clued us off to there's something going on in this model um, that just isn't, you know, it just needs some tweaking in order to bring in a little bit more empirical data and realism here. Um, we know that Atlantic herring are a very important component of striped bass diets in some regions and seasons. Um, but the group conducted some preliminary analysis that suggested that the model is uh, kind of creating this due to a lack of seasonal and spatial dynamics in the model rather than real ecosystem dynamics. And so what the work group is going to do is we're going to work to build in some more of these seasonal and spatial dynamics for the next um, benchmark assessment. And the reason we have to do that is because um, when you update something so uh, so in, like critical within your stock assessment, it's considered a new benchmark assessment. So we need to run that through the peer review process, and we don't want to just focus on doing that for herring. We also want to bring in more seasonal and spatial dynamics for the rest of the species of the model. So after a lot of deliberation, I'm sure a lot of you tuned into those board meetings, lots of back and forth. Um, ASMFC settled on um, the recommended reference points that uh, the ERP work group recommended based on these status quo 2017 levels for the near-term management of Atlantic Menhaden. Um, and these ERPs really aim to provide enough Menhaden to sustain striped bass, which is again, the most sensitive predator in the models. Um, and in August, the board adopted these ERPs, which is a really huge step in ecosystem-based um, And what I put up here on the screen um, is a quote from the board chair um, that went out with one of the press releases after adopting these ecosystem reference points. And I think that the one thing that's really important to note here is that adjusting Menhaden fishing pressure using these reference points isn't the silver bullet here. So. If the board chose to cease Menhaden fishing altogether, our striped bass population still wouldn't recover because we also need to reduce fishing pressure on striped bass. There's a lot of different things at play. And so, again, it's important to think about this as like a whole ecosystem approach. So we need to use the rest of our management tools, turn those various buttons and dials in conjunction to make sure that we're creating the ecosystem that works for all of these species. So we now have our ERPs established, and with that, we move on to tax species. So as a reminder, the board has set annual or multi-year tax that are always based on the best available of science. And so moving forward with these established ERPs, um, we are using those in order to set our tax. Um, however, the projections are again uh, run using that single species band model since it's a lot better at uh, creating these short term projections that give us an idea of what things look like um, when we are under different fishing pressures. So the TC um, undertook an analysis for the board um, and the board had requested that the tax have um, varying probability of exceeding this ERP fishing mortality rate of F target um, in different 5% uh, percent increments. So that went from 25% to 60%. And then that was uh, using 2020, looking at 2021 and 2022 combined and a separate years. That's a little bit confusing, but we don't need to dig in too, too much to that. 
Um, and the other task that the board asked was they wanted to see what the percent risk of exceeding that ERP F target was if the current TAC was changed by um, different 10% increments. Um, so uh, a 10 and 5% increment. So we'll get into those ones next. Um, so this is just a kind of a quick screenshot overview to address that second board task, because this is kind of, you guys all know, spoiler alert, you know where we landed. Um, but this is what the board looked at, and they were looking at the percent risk of exceeding that ERP target and threshold under the current TAC levels, and then both above and below the current TAC levels in 5% increments. Um, so uh, you can kind of see those up here, and we will move into where we landed. So um, this was the TAC that the board decided to go with, um, and once again, I just Put up a quote from um, the board chair so that you guys can just kind of get a flavor of what you know discussions in the room ended up looking like. Um, and you know, Spud says the TAC represents a, a measured and deliberate way for the board to move forward into the realm of ecosystem based management while still striking a balance between stakeholder interests to maintain harvest on Menhaden at recent levels while also allowing ERP models to do what they're intended. So this was kind of just giving you guys an idea of a lot of the conversations that went on in that management room. And this is where we landed um, with our TAC for 2021 and 2022. So um, I thought that the group would be interested in seeing what that ends up looking like for Virginia. Um, and so Virginia receives 78.66 uh, of the coastwide TAC. Um, and this is after the 1% episodic events set aside is kind of taken out of that overall tack. Um, and that equates to approximately uh, 333 million pounds. Um, from there, as I'm sure you all know, the quota is divided into our three sectors, reduction, our per same bait sector, and our non per same bait sector. Um, and from there, our non per same bait sector is further divided into gear types. Um, and just so everybody kind of understands this process, these numbers aren't finalized yet. So per Amendment 3, the states have until December 1st to decide if they'd like to relinquish quota back to ASMFP. So there are some states that um, take about a 0.5% of the quota, um, and that's kind of, they oftentimes kind of throw that back into the pool and then that's reallocated to the states based off of their state allocation. Um, and the commission, our commission, will review the finalized quota numbers in regulation at the December 8th commission meeting. So these are kind of the quota numbers that you see right now and they'll probably change depending on how much quota ends up being relinquished right prior to that December 8th meeting. Um, and sort of just with that, here is the list of folks on the Ecological Reference Points work group. This is a giant undertaking. Um, I'm just a small player in that. Um, and it's a very large group of people that uh, tackled this, uh, a very historic, um, you know, step forward in management. Um, and with that, I'm kind of happy to take questions from anyone, um, talk through, um, you know, some of the models or anything else. Uh, just feel free to let me know what you'd like to chat about. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Shannon. Yeah. Um, that was really well done. I uh, appreciate your thoroughness there. So let's limit questions to panelists. Um, I'm not sure if there's a raise your hand option on this or if you just want to identify yourself and go forward with a question, that'd be great. Yeah, right. Yeah, there's not. So if folks just uh if if our committee members just want to unmute themselves and talk, that's fine. Anna, this is Monty. I have a question if no one else does. Sure, go ahead, Monty. Yeah, on one of your slides. Your ERP reference point slide, it, it noted that the target um, was 0 0.19 for the ERP target, the new yep. ERP target. Mm -hmm. um, 
what has what has the fishing level been at at the 216 the the, the pre uh the pre 10 percent reduction what's the what's the uh what's the actual fishing been at under the 216,000 metric ton level yeah so the so far the fishing level has been about uh 0.17 so we've actually been below that target thus far okay thanks Hey, Shanna, it's Chris Moore. Um, quick question for you about the NWAX and MICE model. Uh, you mentioned that had already gone through peer review. I know there was some discussion about some additional improvements or changes to that and then a possible new peer review. Is that already in schedule or is that somewhat TBD? Yeah, so typically with um, SMFC species, we go through a benchmark assessment every five years. So, like I was kind of talking about those, those issues that we sort of found with herring and recognizing that we now need to throw in more spatial and seasonal components to understand that relationship better. We'll do that over the course of these next five years, as well as potentially develop um, different or alternative modeling approaches. And then those would go again in that five year time frame to get peer reviewed again. Um, we usually do an update like midway through those few years, but you know, the rules of updates are different than the rules of benchmarks. So we can't change too much um, during the update, but once we do a benchmark, we can, we can make a lot of adjustments and improvements. Then. Thank you. Yep. So Shanna, following on that, um, Years ago, the cycle for Menhaden single species BAM model was um, six years for every benchmark, with the three year interim being the update. Um, we kind of got off that cycle when, when the single species model suggested overfishing was occurring. Um, is, is that, has it been re redefined to be a five year cycle or is it still harkening back to six? Um, I think it's. The problem is it's a little bit up in the air right now. So the other issue is with using this NWAX mice model, we need all of these single species assessments data to sort of fall exactly when we want to do the benchmark assessment. So I think ASMFC is still in the process of adjusting um, all of those <laughs> to yeah. figure out how to get these things to work in coordination. So five years is an approximate, yeah. um, it's not a definite, it might be six, it might, you know, it, it just kind of depends on what they can kind of do to stuff everybody else's single species assessments in at the correct time to line up with that timing. Right, so I, was, I wanted for the benefit of, of the, you know, for all the committee members to understand the timing, the terminal year in the assessment is 2017, correct? Yes. So, the earliest we can expect an update would probably be 22, is that right? Yeah, that's probably right. And that would probably bring at most the terminal year to 19 or 20, so. Yeah, depending on what we had available for all of the other predator species and prey species. Right. So yeah, I just wanted to make sure everybody's aware of the timing is, is um, we're always lagging behind in this process because it's a, it's a massive analytical, um, endeavor and it takes you know many many months to work through these assessments so just make sure everybody's up to date on that any other questions for shanna shanna this is aj i have a question hey aj hey thanks for the presentation um you mentioned on one of the slides that you were surprised or the tc was surprised i guess about the relationship that came out between atlantic herring and, and striped bass and at the bottom of that slide, there was, you know, more work to be done. Do you have a timeline on when that work is going to be done? Yeah, so that's kind of, that's kind of goes hand in hand with the question that Chris was asking. So as we continue to um, work on this model, it will, all of that, um, all of those improvements and updates can only be done at a benchmark stock assessment. So um, essentially what happens is you, you know, you have a stock assessment and that model is peer reviewed. And once it's peer reviewed, you can only make very minor changes when you're doing stock assessment updates. Um, and so we have to make kind of larger changes in order to integrate this, this spatial and seasonal component into the model. So that would probably be on that timeline that Rob's talking about. So we're looking at five, six, 
years out, maybe even longer, just kind of depending on where all of these other single species assessments fall um, in that timeline. So ASMSC kind of has some work to do to figure out how to coordinate all of these different assessments to work just for this one assessment. Yeah, no, I understand there's a lot of work around it. Um, if I could just ask a follow up along those sure. lines. Um, so clearly, you know, the, the timing is important here, right? Um, and the TAC is set for 2021 and 2022. And my question is, do you feel there would be any additional information available before the TAC would be set in theory for 2023? Potentially, um, because we'll do a stock assessment update probably in 2022. But again, that's going to be kind of timeline dependent on things. So it won't be an entire new model. So a lot of these seasonal and spatial components, it's not going to get worked out during that stock assessment update. But the update will once again tell us where we are. Are we overfished? Are we overfishing? What did we? What did it look like for the previous few years? Right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Shanna, one more question. This is Chris, if I may. Sure, go ahead, Chris. Um, in addition to the quotas that you listed in your allocation slide there, um, there still is the ability to have the 12,000 pound bycatch provision, which doesn't count against the quota in, in, I mean, in all states, but in Virginia as well. Just wanted to confirm that. Yeah, that's correct. So um, this smaller sector, the, the non persane bait sector, that's where that uh, bycatch provision comes in. It's actually 6,000 if you're just working by yourself, if you're tending a net with another person, it's 12. Um, and so if the per bait, the non per se bait sector um, utilizes all of its quota for a season, they roll into that bycatch provision mode where they have um, that cap at 6,000 or 12,000 pounds. And uh, I know this is a little outside of the presentation that you gave, but do you have any idea about how much additional catch we've had using that bycatch provision? Um, it's not a lot. I okay. can tell you that, um, but I'm not exactly sure. I, I'd have to look at those numbers for you, Chris. I'm just not sure. And it doesn't happen every year either. It's very sporadic. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, everyone. Any other questions for Shanna? Hey. All right. Could I just make a comment? This is Dan Knott. Sure. sure. Um, and this is kind of goes to what Chris was just asking. Uh, I, I crab mainly, and what I do to offset my bait cost is uh, run a gill net, and a lot of times I use all of that, you know, bycatch that I get from Menhaden in the spring to fill my freezer, so I don't have to purchase bait. So for the small time crabbers, I know that that bycatch provision is pretty critical and that probably makes up most of what that catch is down at VMRC when it's reported, but it is, you know, pretty minimal amount and it's strictly most of them are crabbers that are trying to offset their bait costs because that is my, you know, that's my highest cost in the crabbing industry right now is my bait. So just a little FYI there. Thank you. All righty, great. Um, thank you, Shanna. And I think, let's see, we'll move on to Pat Gear on disaster relief. Pat, do you have slides or are you just going to um, give an overview? Pat, you're on mute if you're talking. Robbie does not have slides. I do know that. Okay. Hi, thank you. I do not have slides. Thank you. Okay. That's um, you know, you, you're probably all aware that the CARES Act allocated $300 million to the seafood industries in, impacted by COVID-19. Uh, NOAA used their used a formula to come up with what each state would get. Um, Virginia only got $4.5 million. We thought it would be substantially more, but the way that they did the calculations, it was based on home port. We have a lot of scallops that have landed in the state, but the home port for those vessels are outside of Virginia. So none of the scallop fishery went into our calculation. So we only, we only got $4.5 million. Um, of that, NOAA, NOAA took a small administrative cost. ASMFC is going to be writing the checks for most of the states. 
and they took a very, very tiny amount of money to basically purchase the checks is what they did. So um, that leaves about 4.484,370 dollars for us to distribute to the to uh, Virginia fishing industries. We had to develop a, a spending plan that had to be approved by NOAA. Uh, this was back and forth. We, we had to get a lot of guidance from NOAA. Um, every time we asked the question, we had to wait two or three weeks. Um, but we finally, we got our spending plan up there. They had some questions, but we finally got it approved. Uh, we opened up round one of funding, which was um, round one was gonna be for our known universe, people who had an MRC ID number. So folks that are, you know, registered with licenses in the state of Virginia, that was a, they were known entity, people that we can identify. And we allocated 3.9 million to, those, to, to that group. Um, um, roughly about 2,200 people would be qualified to apply for um, um, in this round one. Uh, the application period opened, I think it was October 13th, and it just closed on November 6th. Uh, of the 2,200 people, we only received applications from 676 folks. Uh, of those, 615 have been approved for assistance, and the other 62 were denied assistance mostly because they didn't complete the application. They started the process and they never finished. So we, we, have, we, have, we reached out to all those folks numerous times. And, uh, you know, some people didn't respond. Some people said they decided they weren't going to do it. They didn't feel they were qualified because of some of the criteria we had. Um, there was only a, less than five people who we outright denied. They, we said they were not qualified. They weren't, they, they weren't eligible in round one. So um, we've just finished that up. We're gonna be sending that information to ASMSC very shortly. And uh, hopefully those people will, those 615 people will be receiving a check hopefully before the holidays. Uh, round two, which opens uh, opened yesterday, is designed for those folks who don't have an MRC ID number, uh, such as mates on boats, uh, people working um, in processing houses and fish houses and things like that. Those folks that you know aren't you know are don't have an MRC number for the most part. Um, and the deadline for those folks is December fourth. Uh, the total funding for that is about five hundred thousand dollars. Uh, and those people who were denied funding in round one, um, that's where we stand right now. We, we're hoping to get the bulk of that money out um, very shortly. Uh, this round two, because we don't know who's going to apply. That first round, we knew who, we knew who, we sent letters to everybody we knew would possibly be eligible. This next round, we have no idea how many people are going to apply. So. The more people that apply, the less money the folks will get. Um, but, um, you know, we're just starting that. Uh, the staff have put in a, an insane amount of time and effort into this. Uh, our IT group has been outstanding, creating, you know, creating online applications. So you can go and apply online um, or you can, you can fill out an application and send it in for round one. Um, if you were applying, if you, you could, we mailed you an application, all you had to do is check some boxes and sign your name and send it back to us. Or you could go online and do the same thing. Um, for certain, um, like charter captains, because we don't have a lot, we don't have any effort data on them, they would have to, you know, they would have to send us some verification that they were, they worked in that industry. And that you, most of those, most of them did that through their um, Schedule C's, I think is what it is, your Schedule C, which says what your uh, occupation is or your company name. And uh, uh, it, it worked out fairly well. I mean, um, like I said, mo you know, it's the people who supplied that information, we were able to approve them very quickly. So um, so right now we're in the start of the second round and we'll, you know, we've been ask answering lots of questions every day. We've got two staff dedicated to answering questions. Um, and um, we're, we're hoping to get as much as money out to the folks. It would be great if everybody can have a check in their hand before the holidays. Um, I don't know if that's going to happen with these round two folks, but um, it's been a lot of work. I mean, and I, we, we were a little disappointed about the about the number of people applied, but talking to the other states, they were seeing the same thing. They were they were seeing uh, less than 50% of the folks that will you know that they thought would be eligible applying in most states. Some states it was even less than that. So. Um, that's where we're moving with that. And I'll, you know, if you have any questions for me, I'll try to take them at this time. Great, thanks, Pat. Um, any questions on disaster relief?
No, I'm not hearing any. Nope. Nope. All right, so we'll close the door on that. Um, move into other business. Um, I have a few things I'd like to bring to the floor. Um, most mostly just about um, committee operations and function. We are, we, you know, we are new. Um, so it might be worth galvanizing um, and putting some thought into how, when in the year do we want to meet? Um, is April and November the appropriate time or should that be shifted under the notion that we have to meet twice a year? Or so says the legislation, we're, we're, we're shooting to meet twice a year. Does anybody have um, ideas or thoughts on timing of meetings? Hey, Rob, this is Jenna. Um, I do think having one in November feels appropriate um, since it's after the ASMFC board meetings that they usually end up uh, discussing the tax setting process. So it might be good for the committee to get updates after that point. Yeah, I would agree. Um, I was wondering if we should move the um, other one a little earlier to be more of a pre-fishing pre season, but, but April's early yeah. enough, so. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I, I was thinking the same thing because the season will start. Um, I have it as May May third next year, is what I have it down as. And so, uh, meeting in April might be kind of late. Um, you know, we may want to move that to March. You know, you know, or, you know, March or something like that, early March, so that we can, if we had to do anything, we could do it at our um, March uh, commission meeting. Right, I, I tend to agree. Any anybody object or have any more to add on on um, shifting our meetings to be March and November? This is Chris. I, I think the only thing I might add is I, I think we'd be well served to have a at least one more meeting, maybe in the middle of the year. I think there are a number of things. I know uh, Steve Atkinson had forwarded around some thoughts. I think there are a number of things that we're going to kind of need to to chew on, especially over the you know next couple of years. And I think having just two meetings a year probably isn't going to leave us enough time to to do yes. that. Uh, so I, I, I would um, ask that we add a third meeting somewhere, you know, maybe early summer, midsummer in their time frame. Okay. So Chris, this is Pat again. And, uh, you know, that's a good idea. I mean, we have to meet twice a year. And if we set those two meetings up, we know we have those. But we, we were hoping to do something this year. You know, we, we talked about, I guess, in April about having something early, like in August or September, but just with COVID-19 and everything, it kind of got us a little bit behind the eight ball. So, um, and, and it, there, may be a, there may be a circumstance like what happened with FMAC last year where we have to meet monthly. If we, if, you know, mm -hmm. God forbid we ever get to that point. I mean, you know, but it's uh, um, depend. Each each one of our committees, when they you know they, they meet accordingly, we have a, a minimum amount that they have. What they're, um, you know, I think the Blue Crab Committee in the past, when some of the things that we do, and they were meeting like you know sometimes twice a month. So, um, it's up to the committee and it's up to the workload of the committee. You know how often we meet, but we could, you know, we can easily go ahead and schedule another one if we feel we need to. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think that makes some sense. Um, any more discussion on, on this issue? Um, agenda setting is another thing that's on my mind. Um, I'd like to propose kind of an operational framework for the group. Um, and really maybe the best way to describe that is, is what I would prefer to not see happen. And that is, a lot of discussion happen like uh, under other business where the, the group hasn't had ample time to prepare and think about what might be um, coming down the next meeting's agenda. So I know Steve, Steve, uh, I appreciate you forwarding your, your written comments. I'm glad that you're able to, to make the meeting today. Um, but some of the things that you mentioned in there um, have significant implications and some downstream effects. And I would just like to be able to treat each topic kind of comprehensively with with available information and, and um, a cogent discussion rather than having um, it just come out and be dro dropped on the floor with without any you know opportunity for preparation or, or thinking through all the implications of a particular topic. So um, I was going to propose that if individual committee members have things that they want to bring to the floor that they email or communicate with me and Shanna 
and we'll do our best to try to set up an agenda um, ahead of time so that folks you know have ample time to understand what's going to be coming down the road and if if an individual is proposing a, a topic of discussion that that person um, prepare some remarks and some o overview as to you know defining the issue defining the question or the problem whatever it might be and then some rationale for moving forward um, to kind of objectively evaluate that uh, um, that issue um, this may require VMRC staff or me or Shanna to do a little bit of homework on uh, downstream impl implications so I think those are important to bring to bear um, so does anybody object to that sort of strategy moving forward? And of course, VMRC has the authority to set the agenda and put items on there as well, but I'm just trying to make it so that it's an open process for everybody to be able to um, bring forward what they're thinking. Rob, this is Ken, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I presume that you're the uh, chairman because I came in very late and I really didn't know who was speaking here. Um, I did hear all of Shanna's uh, presentation. Um, uh, how, how long, how far in advance of the of a scheduled meeting do you want to ha have these comments? And and uh, and uh, as an addendum to that, I I, I want to note a little bit of disappointment on my part because I think Steve brought these points up uh, at the last meeting, and they're not on the current agenda. Maybe that's because we didn't have some operational structure or or a chairman, but we already know those points right now. Uh, I'm disappointed we're not getting to discuss those, and they certainly should be a topic at the very next meeting at the very least. Yeah, so I think your latter comment there is, is, is germane. We had our first meeting because we had the compliance issue squarely in front of us, um, and we were not able to kind of do some meeting logistics and housekeeping there. Um, ordinarily, I would like to think something that Steve brought up you know, would make the agenda, and I'm, I'm fully expecting it to make the next agenda. The trouble with some of the things that Steve brought up, for example, the coal regs line and things like this is some of these boundaries are galvanized in the addenda associated with the ASMFC plans. There's some, you know, procedural issues with this particular one, at least, that I don't feel like as a group we're prepared to fully um, describe or digest before making any kind of decisions or recommendations to on on this particular issue. So I just want to try to set up a, a, a strategy and a, and, a, and a structure that allows us to fully um, evaluate all angles of um, any proposed agenda item. Mm -hmm. So Rob, uh, this is Steve to, to that point. And by the way, I'm, I am happy to be here instead of having my shoulder cut on today. <laughs> but um, uh, so, so to that point, what give me help me understand the the item number one that I that I put in writing, and as you know, that that is a follow up to a previous discussion we had at the last meeting. Just kind of help me understand, and maybe help the committee understand what it would look like um, in, in terms of what it would take to address something like item number one, the the line of demarcation. Yeah, so I think if, if that's something you want to see on the agenda, I would recommend bringing it to our my attention, Shanna's attention as soon as you can. I mean, we've already done this. Now you've done this with, with these issues. Um, and so in preparation for our next meeting, it would be on the agenda. And I think, you know, in the interim, Shanna and I would have to um, lean on VMRC staff and, and collectively come up with the implications or uh, downstream effects that something like this would have to bring to bear so the committee has full disclosure. Um, may maybe not all issues that come on the agenda will require that, but I know a lot of these are really tangled up in different levels of the management plan and, and those, you know, those are important um, considerations to bring forward. Um, yeah, and I think... Um, Mr. Chairman, no, this is Pat. I mean, one of the things, you know, it's... It's not as simple as us doing a reg regulatory change. It's it's ASMFC is involved in this, and we'd have to do because the Chesa the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel is defined as the, is the bay boundary in in their fisheries management plan. So they would have to do an addendum or an amendment as well. Otherwise, we'd be we'd be in conflict with with the FMP. In addition to that, you know Noah Beaufort is collecting all this information, 
and they're using the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel as, as that point that separates the bay from the ocean. And there would be a fair amount of work on their part to go ahead and and change it to the coal regs line, you know, so it's not as simple as us just going ahead and doing it. There are, you know, there are other entities that are using that boundary as, as the Bay ocean boundary at this point. So it, it's, we weren't trying to put it off, but it's like, there's a, there's a fair amount of work that would have to be done with those group in conjunction with those groups to get this done. And uh, Rob, this is Steve again, just the, the, just to, finish that discussion. The, the second item, again, was not anything we, we talked about, as I recall, last time, but was really waiting on to see what ASMSC did with respect to the TAC, with respect to the ERPs. So once we knew that, I felt like I was in more of a position to suggest that we we may want to look at, at the Bay cap, given, given the 10% reduction in the tax. And I realize there's there's more to that than, than meets the eye. Yeah, and, and that's exactly it. I think under what I would like to see become more normal operations is, you know, you bring something like that forward and we have some time to um, process how we're going to structure our discussion. If there's going to be additional information, slides put together, that sort of thing, um, there would be ample time to do that before the meeting and have um, have you know a more objective discussion about whatever it is that's on the agenda so i think if you can endure us feel you know feeling a little bit of um growing pains as a group um hopefully we can get a little more of a smooth operation rolling for next year rob this is ken so get back to my original question is how much time is ample time ahead of the meeting for any these or any other issues that may come forward I think that's up to up for discussion. I would suggest um, materials. Well, I would suggest agenda items be put forth um, as soon as possible, but no no later than two weeks before the meeting. Um, and then that agenda item, the person who originates that agenda item would um, be expected to make a presentation. That can be slides, that can just be an overview, that can be a white paper um, that's written ahead of time. Again, ideally two weeks before the meeting so we can post the materials and have um, enough time for all committee members to review them in advance. And then, um, and then it, you know, we proceed with discussing it as the agenda unfolds. Any Bob, if I, if I may, this is Shana. Okay. Um, I'd recommend a month in advance. Month? Yeah, okay. because in order for us to get things posted two weeks in advance, we still want to have some time to do the background legwork if there's anything necessary from, you know, VMRC or from you. Just give us a little bit of time to collect that information and make sure that we have something to um, help move the discussion forward. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, that probably makes more sense. Um, so, yeah. Agenda items can come whenever, but maybe they close within one month of the meeting that is, is upcoming. Um, anything that would come to mind after that month period would be pushed to the next meeting's agenda. And um, written materials would be, you know, expected on um, during the meeting when the agenda is being discussed by the person who, who nominated that particular agenda item. For discussion, and then, as Shannon alluded to, there may be some legwork that that she and I need to do, or other members of EMRC staff um, to fill in some of the other uh, components of what the issue might involve. Yeah, and Ken, Ken, just to let you know, you can you can um, anybody on the committee can reach out to myself or Rob or or Shanna <laughs> or any of our staff if you have ideas. I mean, you know, things that you want us to look into. We can't guarantee sure. we're going to look into everything, but you know, if it looks like it's an issue of concern, you know, we'll start we'll start putting some time into it. You know, we've we've already started putting some time into the um, the the call rags line. You know, looking at that, trying to put some information in GIS and taking a look at that. So, you know, we can put time in it. You know, we can't do everything, but if there's an issue that the the, commi the committee wants us to look at, we'll be certain to have it ready by the next meeting. Yeah, Pat, this is Ken. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, I would also suggest, however, that it would really be good if we could get the minutes in a more uh, timely fashion and not 
with a meeting notice, um, you know, before the meeting. So, frankly, I'd like to see minutes um, fairly soon after meetings conclude rather than right before the next meeting. Okay. Um, can we minutes? actually post those yeah. online immediately after, probably within about a week? Um, but we can email those directly to the committee as a reminder, but they are posted online uh, probably about a week or so after. Yeah, well, it'd be great if you could uh, e email them to the committee members, in my opinion. Most definitely. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, so Rob, Rob, this is Steve again. Just just one more process question then. So if if we if I would like to see the Bay Cap issue addressed at our next meeting, I would simply need to provide that to you in writing at least 30 days prior to the next meeting. Is that correct? I think that's what we're kind of outlining here as a framework. Anyone, uh, Shannon, is that how it's shaping up in your mind? That's how it's shaping up in my mind. I would say that the month is a uh, a minimum. You know, Steve, you've already sent these uh, things to us ahead of time. So we're kind of prepared for March and that's great. It gives us a good amount of time. Um, and since we already kind of have an idea that we'll be having meetings in March and November, we'll, um, you know, we'll work to get those on the schedule, but we all sort of know that those things need to be at the very latest in by either February or October to make the meeting after that. Right. And, and so one, one final process question. So it, let's just say as an example, if the committee were to agree or take a vote and the vote is whatever, seven to two, that something needs to be done with, for example, the Bay cap, would then the committee's recommendation be taken to the commission for a final vote? Is that how it works? Steve, I'll, I'll explain that. I'll explain that to you, Steve. I mean, okay. you, are an you are an advisory committee. So we, we come to you for advice. You can you can make a you know as a as a group you can make a motion and say this is what we support, and we take that information when we go to the commission meetings and we say this is what we received from our advisory committee, this is what we received from public comment, and then we we may we will have a staff recommendation as well. Hopefully, all three of them agree. I mean that's the that's the goals, and we're all in consensus, and um, it goes before the commission and they discuss it and they they have the final say. So um, usually what we would do is also is, I mean, uh, you're probably aware of this, is that we will either ask the chairman or somebody from the committee to speak on behalf of the committee at, at that public hearing if we, if we were doing something. So um, um, if we were making a major change, we'd ask, them to, we'd ask somebody on that committee to speak on behalf of the committee. So, and, and, and all of you are more than welcome to come as general citizens and speak as well at any of our Commission meetings on a, on a topic of you know concern. So that's gotcha. that's the general process. Thank you. Thanks, Pat. Um, any other? I'm trying to think, Shannon. Any other kind of committee function structural things that we should address? I don't think so, Rob. I think I think that. I think that's an excellent idea, and I'm I'm glad to see us moving forward procedurally with that. Okay. Um, Rob, can I? Can I, I, I'd like to just ask, uh, with respect to future meetings, the next meeting that we will hold is in March, and at this point, it's going to be a virtual meeting. Is that right? As I would right assume. Now, yeah. I would assume it's going to be a virtual. I would assume. Yeah. At I mean, some I point, wouldn't. Yeah. That will at some point in time we will actually be meeting in in person. Is that right? Yes. We, yes, we will be at some time. Yes, sir. Good. Uh, I, and and I will just say, um, living in rural Eastern Virginia on the Eastern Shore, where internet service is notoriously fickle, um, this WebEx thing um, didn't work very well for me today. Mm -hmm. uh, I've had no trouble in the past with Zoom, but I'm also experiencing difficulties with my internet provider right at the moment. So I'm not sure what the problem is, but I'm I'm not right now. I'm not very fond of this this process. Yeah, it, I mean, I don't think any of us are. I mean, it's 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 the best we can do right now because we're still under an executive order that we you know 
Um, we are only allowed to have limited number of people in the building at one time, and we're not allowed to have anybody from the public in the building at all. Yeah. And so un until that executive order gets lifted, we, can't, we cannot have a meeting in our wonderful brand new commission room. Um, you know, once we are allowed to have public meetings, we will also still have the option of, of using the WebEx for fo folks that can't attend in person. And that just allows us to have, you know, more participation in folks. So um, it, it's not an ideal situation. It's, you know, nothing is this year. I think, you know, we, you know, like I said, when we met on April 20th, we were doing it by the, we were doing up our shoestrings. We, we were just hoping to get through that meeting and nothing would go wrong. And then we did a commission meeting a few days later and we got through that and we've just gotten a little bit better each time. And, you know, and then we apologize that you had some, you know, some connectivity problems and, you know, we work really hard to try to correct those with folks. So, um, but yeah, until, until things settle down and the governor lifts the executive order, this is how we're going to have to meet, unfortunately. And when, and the state, and the state's not allowed to use Zoom. And, and Ken, this is Shanna. Um, before the next meeting, we can work with you personally since yeah. you, we've had problems with your connectivity to try to figure out what specifically is going on um, or if it's just better to have you call in. Um, and then we can just send you presentations ahead of time. So at least you'll be able to visually see the presentation while still being on the phone. Yeah, thank you. I, I really was at a loss trying to imagine what your presentation looked like. <laughs> Yeah, that's no problem. We'll try to work with you to get yours up and running. But if we're still having issues, like, unfortunately, we're not IT staff, we're fishery staff. Um, so we'll try to see what we can do to help you ahead of time before the next meeting. Um, and if we're still running into issues, we'll try to make sure that you have some PDF yeah. copies of the presentations ahead of time yeah. specifically. That's great. Yeah. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, Shannon, Shannon, I know you're working from home. Is this, uh, is this uh, meeting being recorded? as the video and will it be available on our on our youtube site it will be yes so so ken that's the other option too is we record all of our meetings and uh -huh. so you could you could go back and watch it on our youtube site and we'll send you that link because um we've noticed we've noticed that more people are watching it watching our meetings after the fact on the on our youtube channel than chiming in, you know, calling in during the meeting. So they can watch it at their at their leisure and, and skip over things that they don't want to listen to. So um, so we'll make sure you get that as well so you can pick up on the items you miss. And if you have any questions, give one of us a call. Thank you. So thanks everyone for indulging um, the sometimes dry discussion of procedure, <laughs> but I think we um, we have a little bit of a framework to our operations, which is good moving forward. Um, I didn't mean to do dominate the other business categories or anything um, else from anyone under other business. Okay, I'm not hearing much. Um, Mr. Chairman, we have to take public comment. Too yeah, as well. I was going to I was going to close the floor unless there's um, anything from panelists before we move on to public comment. Anything last minute from panelists? Okay. Um, who's organizing public comment? Is that Olivia? It's me, Olivia Shanna Rob. Um, right, so. Yeah. Um, if folks would like to public comment um, and they are on the WebEx, we've asked that they please uh, use the chat function at the bottom of the screen to indicate that they would like to make public comment. Um, if you are on a phone, let me look. Oh, I've only got one phone user and that's Ken, so we don't, we don't have to worry about that tonight. But if you'd like to make public comment, please chat us and let us know that you would like to speak. All right. First up, I've got Ben Landry. Ben, I'm going to unmute you, and then you can address the committee. Um, okay. Hey, guys. This, um, my name is Ben Landry. I'm uh, with Omega Protein as a member of the public on this. And thank you for allowing me to comment on this. And I don't want to belabor the the process point, but I guess this is a question more for staff or perhaps for Rob, but you know, 
Where does scientific evidence or research come into play with this board? Um, you know, ASMFC has traditionally had a great deal of responsibility for managing this fishery, and they have kind of initiated um, new regulation or new uh, man Manhattan management. Uh, does does VMRC have a requirement to use the best available science? You know, say, you know, for uh, argument's sake, if this committee voted to determine that the sky is green instead of blue, uh, does the staff then jump in and say, well, listen, we're not going to take that to the full commission or good, you know, I, I guess I'm just trying to figure out, you know, if this board said, well, listen, you should not be able to catch any fish in the Chesapeake Bay. Um, and that would somehow get a majority vote of this board. Would staff say, well, scientifically, there you know, could be some harvest or um, I'm not sure exactly. I'm just trying to understand kind of the process and whether science has been thrown out of this this Manhattan Manage uh, Advisory Board, or if it has some, you know, some tenants that need to be uh, achieved. Ben, I'll, I'll chime in on that. This is Pat. Uh, you know, science is you know is going to drive what we do. Um, you know, at a re for, for respect for our advisory committees, we will always take. We will always when we're when we're doing something, we will always provide that information to the commission. Now, we may decide that we are not going to take action on some, you know, on, on some issue, but if we're going in front of the commission with a Menhaden regulation, regula regulation change, and we've, we've uh, um, taken that to this committee or any one of our advisory committees, we will provide that information to the commission. Um, and then we, and we, and we will say whether or not we support it or we're opposed to it. We, the, the, the staff has their recommendation, the committees have their recommendation, and you know, and then the public can chime in, and then the commission has the final final say. So, um, um, but you know, th that's the way we work. We we just provide what the we provide a summary of what the what the the committee said, and the chairman can get up there, and the chairman has the opportunity to speak during public comment and provide any additional information. So, um, yeah, it, it, if the if the sky if they say the sky is green, we would probably try to talk them off that cliff at the at that at the advisory committee meeting is what we would try to do and try to come to some some you know common ground on things but if um you know we out of out of respect to the committees we will take that forward we will take their recommendation and say as the as the total package and move it forward uh, okay thank you Pat. ben i can add a little bit to that um i didn't explicitly identify science but um my rationale for proposing, you know, lead time and preparation time for agenda items is to have the ability to bring science in when it's relevant yeah. to the discussion point. Um, I would envision science to be um, involved where appropriate um, heavily in, in the activities of this group, because I think whatever our advice to the commission, however it, it you know, manifests, I would like it to be um, drawn from a comprehensive body of information and not just, um, you know, conjecture or opinion or things like this. Okay. So, um, that's kind of where I'm hoping we can go as a group. Now, there may be things that science doesn't have any relevance and, and that's fine, but, but we're appropriate. I'm hoping that we can bring it in and, and maybe we have to, you know, um, slightly modify what's been done because it's more relevant to VMRC in, in Virginia, but but ideally, you know, drawing on that information is going to be important. Thank you. Okay, I don't see anyone else in chat. Um, so if there is anyone else who likes to comment, as a reminder, please just use the chat function um, at the bottom of your screen and indicate that you would like to make public comment. Okay, Rob, I'm seeing none right now. All right, um, so that closes public comment. Um, 
Any last minute things from committee members or from VMRC before we adjourn? No, just thank you very much. Thank yeah. you very much for um, um, indulging us with the, you know this this type of meeting. So we appreciate we appreciate your cooperation. Yeah, I appreciate everyone's uh, participation. Um, reminder: if you have something for the agenda, get it to me, Shanna, Pat, other VMRC staff um, sometime before February or by by early February. Um, thanks for your patience. Thanks for your participation. I hope everyone has a great evening. Um, stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll we'll be in co in contact about the next meeting. Um, you know, probably after the first of the year. Yep. Okay. Thank Thanks, everyone. Rob. Thanks, Shanna. Thanks, Pat. Mm -hmm. Thank you.